morning, dear friends of American Reformed Church. We are so grateful that you are with us this morning, and we are thankful for your patience and your grace. As we had a few technical difficulties, we're so grateful for Megan Wallinga and Tony Altna and the way that they were able to get those worked out, and, uh, and the fact that we're able to be with you live this morning, just a bit delayed from when we normally would be. Today is Pentecost Sunday, and hopefully you've been participating in the at-home liturgy. Uh, we were ushered into worship this morning by the DeCoster family. Uh, we then spent some time uh, listening to a song by Wendell Kimbrew, inviting the Holy Spirit to come and be present among us. Uh, from there, we confessed our sin. We were assured of God's forgiveness through a, a ministry of music, through the Wartburg College Choir, I Need Thee Every Hour. And then we heard the children's message this morning from Director of Children's and Family Ministries, Lizzie Rice, as she led the children in a moment, um, thinking deeply about kingdom and what does it look like to be praying uh, for God's kingdom to come. And now we get to hear God's word together, and I invite you to pray with me. Let's pray together. Gracious God, may your word be our rule your Holy Spirit, our teacher, and the glory of Jesus, our single concern, in whose name we pray. Amen. This morning we hear three scripture passages, first from Psalm 150. Listen for the word of the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty firmament. Praise him for his mighty deeds. Praise him according to his surpassing greatness. Praise him with trumpet sound. Praise him with lute and harp. Praise him with tambourine and dance. Praise him with strings and pipe. Praise him with clanging cymbals. Praise him with loud clashing cymbals. Let everything that breathes praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. And these words... From Matthew chapter 6, verses 7 through 15. Jesus says, When you are praying, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. Pray then in this way, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And do not bring us to the time of trial, but rescue us from the evil one. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. And these words from Matthew chapter 22, verses 34 through 40. When the Pharisees had heard that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together, and one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, which commandment in the law is greatest? Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment, and a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Smack dab in the center of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus chooses to teach his disciples about prayer. Presbyterian preacher Tom Long says that this sermon serves as the constitution of Jesus' kingdom, which must mean that there's something significant at stake here. Jesus' teaching on prayer comes in tandem with his teaching on, on, on giving and on fasting. Jesus wants to teach his followers about practicing their piety, and there's a common theme. It's this. In Jesus' kingdom, our spiritual disciplines are meant to be practiced, not performed. When it comes to giving, prayer and fasting, our attention is focused on God and God alone. Jesus' message is simple and straightforward. Don't give for audience appre appreciation. Don't, don't pray for congregational congratulation. And don't fast for onlooker ovation. 
When it comes to prayer in particular, he's not just focused on the attention-grabbing prayers. Jesus is also worried about syntax. In particular, he's worried about empty phrases and inane wordiness. Do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, Jesus says, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. Prayer is not some spiritual calisthenic, Jesus says. We don't somehow enter into God's good graces according to the quantity or or the quality of the words offer. Nor is prayer our way of serving as God's earthbound secret informants, sharing earth's trade secrets with a God who is distant and aloof, uninvolved and unmoved in heaven. No, God knows what you need before you ask, Jesus says. All of which is to say, prayer's formational power comes not in our ability to garner God's favor with our eloquence, but in our admission that we are utterly and entirely dependent on God's grace. And then, Jesus tells his disciples how to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors and do not bring us to the time of trial but rescue us from the evil one this prayer is remarkably simple it takes about 27 seconds flat to pray it with the congregation on a sunday morning now i suppose one might argue that jesus offers this prayer not as a set prayer but as a suggested prayer or a model prayer if you will a prayer that helps us to compose our own prayers but if that were the case we probably wouldn't find another version of the exact same prayer told by yet another gospel storyteller this time it's luke luke's gospel frames his story surrounding the prayer a bit differently for for luke the prayer comes not in the middle of a sermon but rather in response to a request the disciples having observed jesus praying make a natural request in luke chapter 11 lord teach us to pray as john taught his disciples Jesus then responds with an abbreviated form of the prayer he teaches in his sermon in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 6. In both places, Jesus offers a set prayer, a liturgical prayer, a form prayer, if you will. The disciples want to know how should they pray, how can they pray in such a way that their prayers reflect what they've been learning from this particular rabbi. And note that this isn't unique to Jesus. They frame their request in light of another group of disciples, the disciples of John. Lord, teach us to pray as John taught his disciples. Apparently, the disciples' rabbinical affiliation was easily deciphered by the way the disciple prayed. Now, we know, of course, that there are other examples of Jesus offering extemporaneous prayer, prayer that's spoken with his own words, prayer based upon his own experience, and based upon his dependence on God through what he was experiencing. Extemporaneous personal prayers are vital as followers of Jesus navigate their way through life. God longs to hear the heart cries, the prayers, whatever they may be, from God's people. But if Jesus seems to be telling us anything in the gospel accounts of the prayer, it's this. Prayer isn't about getting God to accommodate to us. Rather, it's about shaping our hearts and minds to acquiesce to God. When we pray the prayer our Lord taught us, we're praying for some things that don't come to us naturally. The language may be simple, but the implications are profound. Hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as is in heaven. I find it fascinating that in both Matthew's Sermon on the Mount In Luke's disciple-to-rabbi account, Jesus teaches his followers to pray by using a set prayer, a form prayer, a prayer that if we mindlessly ignore what we're saying can become rote and, and boring, but a prayer that if we pay careful attention might shape us before we can shape it. When we pray the Lord's Prayer, we can't help but more longingly yearn for the coming kingdom and at the same time work for that coming kingdom in the here and now. It's really no surprise that Jesus offers this kind of liturgical prayer for his disciples. After all, he was raised and reared in the Hebrew faith. This is how he was taught to pray too. As a Jew, he would have learned the 
tefillah, the Hebrew word for prayer, by praying the set prayers given to him by his ancestors of faith. He would have prayed the Shema twice daily. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. He would have learned to pray the lyrics found in Israel's top 150 album, the Psalms. And he would have offered the Amidah, the 18 benedictions, morning, noon, and night. Duke Divinity School's Lauren Winner's explanation is helpful. She writes, Jewish prayer is essentially book prayer, liturgical prayer. Jews say the same set prayers at the same fixed hours over and over every day. There is, to be sure, room for spontaneous prayer, but those spontaneous prayers are to the liturgy what grace notes are to the musical score. They decorate, but never drown out the central theme. I love that. There is, to be sure, room for spontaneous prayer, but those spontaneous prayers are to the liturgy what grace notes are to the musical score. They decorate, but do not drown out the central theme. It's no wonder Jesus taught his disciples the liturgical prayer. For as one engrafted in the Hebrew community of faith, he himself had been deeply formed by set prayers, the Psalms, the twice the thrice daily Amida, the, the, the twice daily Shema had formed him into the person of faith that he had become. And, and we know that Jesus has been shaped by the Psalms and the Gospels. We see him regularly go to synagogue where worship was centered around the Psalms. We hear him ref, reference the Psalms when he teaches the Beatitudes in Matthew 5, when he speaks of the way that people had rejected his ministry in Mark chapter 12, when he hung on a cross and cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? In Matthew 27 and Mark 15. Psalm 150, one of our texts for this morning, was one of the foundational psalms for the Hebrew people as they went to worship. Praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty firmament. Praise him for his mighty deeds. Praise him according to his surpassing greatness. The psalmist goes on to enlist trumpet, lute, and harp, tambourine and dance, strings and pipe, clanging cymbals and loud clashing cymbals, and then concludes with these wonderful words, especially so given its Pentecost Sunday. Let everything that breathes praise the Lord. We know Jesus' daily recitation of the Shema from Deuteronomy 6 was also formational as he borrowed these words and made them the hallmark summation of all the law and prophets. In Matthew 22, a lawyer asks Jesus a question to test him. Teacher, which commandment in the law is the greatest? And Jesus borrows from what he had learned. He borrows from the Shema. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. And then Jesus adds a second piece to the Shema, this time from Leviticus chapter 19. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love God love neighbor these serve as the essential and foundational ethical principles of jesus kingdom new testament scholar scott mcknight calls these commands the jesus creed he believes that very early in the church's life and witness shortly after jesus ascended to heaven the psalms the shema and the lord's prayer became the foundational prayers prayed regularly and recurringly on a daily basis that would shape the church's life and witness. When we pray these liturgical prayers, we are borrowing from the best of the Hebrew tradition. Our forebearers in the faith spoke using two delightful Latin phrases to speak of the symbiotic interplay between prayer and faith and between prayer and work. First, they used the phrase lex orande, lex credende, which means that we pray as we believe. And we believe as we pray. And second, they spoke of ora et labora. We pray as we work, and we work as we pray. This is the gift of structured prayer. We, when we pray liturgically, we are joining our voices with the voices of the saints throughout the centuries who have prayed the very same things. When we pray the Psalms, we join our voices with Moses and Miriam, with Deborah and David, with Hezekiah and Huldah. When we confessionally pray the Shema, we join our lives in bearing witness to the love that Joseph had for his Egyptian neighbors in the midst of his own exile from family, to the love that Ruth shared with her foreigner of a mother-in-law, Naomi, to the chesed that Hosea demonstrated in remaining loyal and loving to his unfaithful spouse. And when we pray the Lord's Prayer, our voices are united with Jesus' voice. 
with Paul's voice and Apollos' voice, with Priscilla and Aquila, with Junia and James, with St. Augustine and St. Catherine of Siena, with Martin Luther and Martin Luther King Jr., with Dorothy Day and Mother Teresa. Liturgical prayer frees us from our cultural curse, the curse of narcissism, the curse of believing that the world revolves around the triune God of me, myself, and I. Our prayer lives can quickly devolve into wish lists focused on our own wants, our own wishes, and our own needs. And while these are certainly important, and God wants us to give voice to all that's stirring inside us, liturgical prayers, set prayers, help us move beyond our narcissism to pray more deeply and to intercede more broadly. Lauren Winter says it this way, It is returning to my prayer book that places me, places me in words that ask me to confess my sins, even when I can't think of any red-letter deeds recently committed. Words that ask me to pray for presidents and homeless Charlottesvillians and everyone in between. Words that praise God even on the mornings when I wonder if God exists at all. Sure, sometimes it is great when in prayer we can express to God just what we feel, but better still when in the act of praying our feelings change. Liturgy is not, in the end, open to our emotional whims. It repoints the person praying, taking him or her somewhere else. And after the heinous death of George Floyd in Minneapolis this past week, one of the greatest gifts of this kind of prayer is this. Liturgical prayer provides us with words when we don't know what else to pray. When we don't know how else to pray. When we don't know whether our prayers are making a damned bit of difference. Wendell Berry says racism is our hidden wound. All due respect to Mr. Berry, but that's a load of bull. The wound's no longer hidden. It's out in the open and in plain sight. The wound's festering and oozing, hemorrhaging hate, fueling discord and distrust, obscuring our vision and stunting our growth and being able to see the image of God in every person on the planet. It's a good thing we have the lament of Psalm 13 because the prayer of Psalm 150 is not enough. Let everything that breathes praise the Lord. Well, that all sounds nice and good if you're white, able to worship in the comfort and convenience of power and privilege. But our dear brother, George Floyd, is all out of breath. So cue the track. Lay down a beat. Lament is the genre du jour. I encourage you to sing in a minor key because this is how the psalmist sings it. How long, O Lord? How long will you forget us forever? How long will you hide your face from us and allow others to drive the faces of our African-American brothers and sisters into the ground? How long must we, must all of us together, bear the systemic pain of racism in our souls, the systemic sorrow of separation and segregation in our hearts all day long? How long shall our enemies, foreigners, instigators from other places intrude on our lands, invade our communities, eliciting riots and violence? How long, O Lord? How long? But lament may be the easy part. Saying what is so for us, naming the pain and the anguish, may be easier than lifting up a future that seems fragile at best. Racism has left us undone, every single one of us undone. How can we ever muster the audacity to pray for anything else? I'm not quite sure, but I do wonder if we might start with the prayer that Jesus taught us. Perhaps we pray to our heavenly parent, asking God to make God's name holy by lifting up the intrinsic value of every human being created in God's image, begging God to usher in God's beautiful, kaleidoscopic, multicolored kingdom, beseeching God to do God's will, God's good and perfect will, God's will of justice and righteousness and peace, God's will of redemption and reconciliation and restoration, beseeching God to do God's will here on earth just as it is already in heaven. If ever there were time, a time to pray a set prayer, a liturgical prayer, it may be now. How else are we going to find the words to pray? Lauren Winner tells a wonderful story arising out of the Jewish tradition about a poor peasant boy 
learning to pray. Because he was poor and of little estate, all he knew was the Hebrew alphabet, the alphabet, which he would sing every day to his sheep. On Shabbat, the boy and his father would go to synagogue to join the Hebrew faithful in prayer. They sat near an out-of-the-way location near the back of the synagogue. Though the boy could neither pray the prayers or sing the songs, he loved going to synagogue. He loved to listen to God's people in prayer. One Shabbat, as the boy sat with his father in the synagogue, hearing the cantor chant the beautiful Hebrew prayers and remembering the alphabet he had learned from his mother, the boy was gripped with a desire to speak directly to God like all those around him. Filled with love for God, the boy began to recite the alphabet, first softly and then louder and louder. His father stopped him. Be quiet, he whispered loudly. You don't know how to read the prayers. Stop talking nonsense. Show respect. You're in the synagogue. The boy sat quietly and after a while began again. Again, his father stopped him. This time he put his hand over the boy's mouth and said, the rabbi will hear you and throw us out for what you are doing. Sit without making a sound or I will take you home. The boy once again sat quietly, but only for a moment. Once again, he was moved by the voices all around him, and all of a sudden, the boy started to recite the alphabet even louder than before. Faster than his father could catch him, he jumped up from his seat and ran to the front of the synagogue. Rabono Shel Olam, ruler of the universe, I know I am only a child. I want so much to sing the beautiful prayers to you, but I don't know them. All I know is the alphabet. Please, dear God, Take these letters of the alphabet and rearrange them to form the words that mean what I want to say to you and what is in my heart. And when the father, the rabbi, and the congregation heard the boy's words, they were moved to tears and began to pray with him. Aleph, Bet, Gimel, Dalet, He, Vav, Zion. Please, dear God, take these letters of the alphabet and rearrange them to form the words that mean what I want to say to you and what is in my heart. Today is Pentecost Sunday, the day when the Holy Spirit came rushing at full force into Jerusalem and fell upon the disciples. Phyllis Tickle, by the way, notes that the timing of the Spirit's arrival was at 9 o'clock in the morning. In other words, The Holy Spirit came at the time of morning prayer, set prayer, liturgical prayer. It's highly possible the disciples were praying the prayer that Jesus had taught them to pray when the Spirit decided to make uh, an appearance. Now, besides putting on a good show, tongues of fire and whatnot, and giving Peter some guts to get up and preach, one of the Spirit's very first acts of business uh, is to create chaos and confusion. The folks gathered in Jerusalem begin hearing gospel, each in their own native tongue. And the onlookers are so alarmed, they first think that the disciples got into the wine, the good stuff. But gutsy Peter, having experienced fresh wind, fresh fire, two millennia before Jim Cimbola wrote the book, stands up to clarify. And essentially what he says is this. Look, I know all of this is chaotic and confusing. All these languages representing all these different groups, tribes, tongues, and nations of people. I I know it probably does look like we've had a bit too much to drink, but, but this is actually what was supposed to happen. You remember the prophet Joel? He said it would be so. Jesus promised it would be so. You see, Jesus has given us a kingdom, a kingdom unlike any other, a kingdom established by his death and resurrection. I know it looks like all hell broke loose, all these different languages, all these different groups of people, no one in charge, no one in control, no one lording power over another, but this is the way it's supposed to be. Chaotic and confusing. The Spirit is doing exactly what the Spirit is supposed to do, messing with all our preconceived religious notions of power and privilege And reminding us that when it comes to the kingdom of Jesus, we had better buckle up and put on our crash test helmets because only one is in control, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. 
So if you're going to keep on getting together for your 9 o'clock prayer meeting, and if you're going to keep up the nerve praying that Lord's Prayer, the one where you pray that the kingdom will come, well, this is the kind of thing that's bound to happen. Indeed, all hell has broke loose. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Before we go to God in prayer, I want to share just a couple of updates in addition to the ones that you received in the pastoral newsletter that was sent out by church email on Thursday, also mailed to those of you who do not have an email address. I want to add just two more requests. First, continue to be praying for Stan and Phyllis DeHaan. After consulting with his doctor, Stan has elected to cease receiving treatments for the mass in his bladder and to focus on enjoying life. Please pray for Stan and Phyllis, for Christ's comfort and peace and love to surround them and sustain them. And then we offer prayers of sympathy for the family of Jerry Reinders. Jerry passed away yesterday, May 30. Jerry was a longtime member of American Reformed Church and had been a resident for several years at Bickford Memory Care in Sioux City and had more recently moved to the Embassy Care and Rehab Center in Sargent Bluff. Funeral arrangements are pending with the Ullman Funeral Home, though we are anticipating a live-streamed funeral service through Facebook Live sometime this coming Thursday. Please check your email and the Ullman Funeral Home website for updates later this week. Let us pray together. Dear God, we are only children. So on this Pentecost Sunday, please take these letters of the alphabet and rearrange them to form the words that mean what we want to say to you and what is in our hearts. A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, N, O, P, Q, R, S, T, U, V, W, X, Y, Z. We pray this in the name of Jesus, the one who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. As I mentioned, when we began this morning, we were ushered into worship through a call to worship from the DeCoster family. And when uh, Elizabeth and I received that video, one of us had a smile uh, that we could not wipe off our faces. The other of us uh, was moved to tears simply because uh, we miss you all and, of course, miss seeing Joshua and Simeon. We also want to acknowledge that today is technically uh, Rosalind's last day in her contract as Director of Youth Ministries here at American Reformed Church. We are so blessed by God for the way that Rosalind has used her gifts to serve in this congregation um, since 2013. You know that Rosalind graduated from Western Theological Seminary in Holland, Michigan with a Master of Divinity degree a year ago and was passed in all of her exams by East Sioux Classes. She is ready to be ordained um, by East Sioux Classes, and she is simply awaiting uh, God's next call for her life. And so we invite you to pray with Rosalind and Philip and, and Joshua and Simeon that God would continue to lead them in this time of uncertainty and transition. They'll continue to be a part of the American church faith family, and we're so thankful to God for that. Philip will continue to direct the choir 
And we do pray um, that God would bless them and keep them and lead them each and every day. You'll also notice in the at-home liturgy that there's a beautiful assurance of, of God's forgiveness that was sung by the Wartburg College Choir and that there was uh, the children's message, which, which fit very nicely into the sermon this morning. But there's also a couple of links that we want you to check out uh, following this this morning. And, and those involve uh, a beautiful and moving rendition of the Lord's Prayer, uh, sung by a diverse group of high school students. And then also a special blessing from 28 different worship leaders in the city of Pittsburgh, representing um, the, across the spectrum of congregational culture, um, the, mo- the, the video and um, the virtual choir is moving to me, and I hope it will be to you as well on this Pentecost Sunday. On Friday, Elizabeth and I posted an update about where we are in terms of reopening the American Reformed Church facility. Essentially, uh, we shared this, we aren't ready to open yet, and we don't want to rush into doing so, simply so that we can ensure the safety of every single person in the ARC community of faith, especially Uh, the most vulnerable among us. Uh, If you have not seen that video, you can check it out. It's posted on the church website, on our Facebook page, and also on our YouTube channel. Finally, many of you may be wondering about this thing called set prayer or liturgical prayer. You may be wondering, where do I start? I want to encourage you to go to the ARC website where at the very top of the homepage, there is a link to liturgical prayer resources. Take some time to review that document, which provides a list of websites and apps and books for your consideration. And I'd like to invite the entire congregation, this week in particular, given all the events happening in our world, to pray along with me the Lord's Prayer three times a day, at 9 o'clock in the morning, at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, and at 9 o'clock at night. I'd invite you to take 27 seconds, three times a day, to simply pray out loud, the words that the Lord taught us to pray. Friends, it is good to be with you in spirit by the power of the Holy Spirit on this Pentecost Sunday. We do indeed miss you. We love you. We pray for you. And now may God's blessing be upon you as you go forth to live and serve the Lord. May the peace of Christ be with you all. Amen.